Hello and welcome to No Rest for the Weekend, the show where we go behind the scenes and talk to the creators of independent entertainment. I'm Jason Godby and I am not in the Rabbit Hole studio today. No, today I am out and about coming to you from New York City in Manhattan at the offices of Pipeline Entertainment. Uh, I am with the uh, people behind Pipeline, Mr. Dan DeFilippo and Caitlin Ronan. Say hi so the people know you're real, guys. How is everybody? Hello. Great. Thanks for having me in your office. I appreciate it. They, they have, security hasn't kicked us out yet. <laughs> uh, so um, I'm going to get right down to it. Uh, for those who don't know, who, who are unfam- unfamiliar with y'all, what is Pipeline? We're a production management firm, so we represent people below and above the line in TV, films, docs, commercials, promos, really everything. And then we uh, also produce film, TV, documentaries, commercials, everything. everything. <laughs> and just uh, give me some highlights. Like, uh, Talk to me about some projects that you guys have done, if you want to rattle off a few names. Sure. Uh, some of our most recent projects were uh, we did a remake of Francis Ford Coppola's Dementia 13 for NBC Universal. We also did the New York leg of Xavier Dolan's upcoming film, uh, The Death and Life of John F. Donovan, starring Kit Harington. Uh, We have a documentary in the works um, in the final stages of post-production about Martin Luther King. Those are probably the most recent Fantastic, fantastic. I know I had, um, I don't know if you guys saw the show, but I had Richard LeMay, the director of Dementia 13. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, Terrific guy. Also had uh, Adonis Salem Paris, who scored that. Mm -hmm. I think I'm finding everybody in the circle of of Dementia 13 (laughs) at some point, like the grip. (laughs) Every PA. We can give you the crew list. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, just work backwards. The DP, the the sound man. Just to give me a little bit of background on you guys, uh, how did you get started in, into filmmaking? Like, how did how did this come about for you? How did the company come about? Good question. I I was a journalist out of college, out in the Hamptons, actually. We were just talking about the Hamptons. Um, and I got a phone call from my buddy in Philly who was moving to L.A., and the Hamptons gets real quiet in the winter. So we jumped in a car and drove to L.A. for two months across the country and just kind of started working for Willie Morris out that way and Oh, the, the business, out there. yeah, yeah. So I transferred from Willie Morris L.A. to Willie Morris New York, and then decided that I wanted to start a smaller firm to represent people, but also to produce. So I opened Doors of Pipeline like eleven years ago. Fantastic, fantastic. And what was the? You remember what was the first project that you guys produced? Straight out of the gates. The documentary Paramore, Born for This, for Atlantic Records and Fuse TV, which followed the band on the Warp Tour. So it was like a, 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 a rockumentary type thing? Yeah, a feature length rockumentary. Very cool. Yeah, it was cool. And Caitlin, what about you? How did you, how did you get in this funny business? Yeah, uh, I went to Fordham University for undergrad, studied film, um, and after college, I started working here at Pipeline as a script reader intern and ended up falling in love with the business, continued working here um, in my position now as executive assistant, um, and just really fell in love with working with people in entertainment, uh, working in production, getting to see all of the different facets of what makes a movie, what makes a TV show, how these different people navigate their careers. Very cool. Um, so uh, walk me through the process, if you will. Like, So a project comes to you guys. First of all, what's the selection process like? Do you guys get a lot of script submissions? Or are you dealing with uh, writer's agents? Like, How does, how does a project come to Pipeline? Uh, it's really everything. I mean, we are avid script readers. Um, we get queries five a day, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) You know, and if it's something we're, if it's, if it's a query in a space that we're actively looking in, we'll, you know, request the script. So uh, you, you get like a treatment or something in an email or you No treatments. No treatments. We don't like treatments. So you just get uh, (laughs) like a pitch kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And like, for example, after delivering Dementia 13, we're, trying to do another kind of horror film with Universal. Oh, cool. So we've been reading tons of horror scripts across the boards. Um, 
Whereas if a romantic comedy comes over, I'm not really interested right now. Because <laughs> yeah. you're, you're looking for a specific thing because that's what Universal is looking for for you guys. Right. Yeah, exactly. So it's really kind of a from the chain down. It's like, okay, this is what distribution wants. Mm-hmm. So this is what we've got to find for them. And usually if something's been successful, well, they want more of the same. To do it again. Yeah. yeah. I know the uh, Blumhouse has been doing that for years with, you know, uh, you know, three, four million dollar budget horror films. Um, I remember uh, I spoke to Richard a bit about Dementia 13, and he was talking about that process and how kind of Universal revived it, and uh, he got hired on as director and so forth. So once, once, once you guys are interested in a project, um, you guys are producing soup to nuts. You're going from yeah. script to exactly. uh, yeah. all the way through production. Sometimes and even writing it. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and you're going through. I'm assuming that you're because you guys also represent folks. That's mm-hmm. the bank of talent that you're pulling from. Yep. Yeah, we we try to hire as many clients as possible on projects, but I mean sometimes they're just all so busy. Right. We have to yeah. go outside of the the pool, so mm-hmm. to speak. And do you have uh, pr- different like production companies that you'll farm stuff out to, or is it like this is all homegrown farm team people for you guys? No, the stuff we produce, we do. Hands on mm-hmm. produce. Wow. You know. Yeah. Um, so you guys are actually out there. You're not just exec producing. You're actually line producing. Oh you're, yeah. You're in the yeah. field doing this Completely, stuff. Completely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very cool. And then um, are you then shepherding it all the way through post? Yeah. Yep. With dementia, you had Universal as a dis- distributor. Mm-hmm. Um, in other cases, do you ever make a movie without a distribution deal first and try to sell it? Yeah, we've done all of the above. Oh, cool. Yeah. And in in your process like that, are you guys? brokering the deal and going through the whole process with that everything okay very mm-hmm. cool um so with um with dementia you guys did this uh recently um i know you mentioned that you're trying to get some some other you're looking for another horror picture right um what does a project have to look like bells and whistles wise f- in order for you guys to want to pick it up like what what's because every i think every screenwriter wants to know like what's my screenplay have to be in order to be special enough that somebody thinks, oh, you know what, I want to produce this. Right. Plus to be good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, we read First everything, like I said. Um, we really pay attention to what's on the page because that's what's going to shine through to the screen. Mm-hmm. If you don't have that blueprint, you're, you know. And when you're doing that, are you thinking about, oh, you know what, this would be a good project for so-and-so to direct. This would be a good project for this team to work on. Uh, and you're putting all that together in your head? Uh, to an extent, also, you know, can we get this project financed? Yeah. <laughs> right. Because all of that means nothing if you, if you don't have a budget, mm-hmm. you know? And are you looking for projects that can sort of be in a specific budget range? Are you looking for, like, you know, with certain, I don't know what the budget was for dementia, but uh, are you looking for something in a similar range? It's got to be under a certain amount or? Not really. Okay. I mean, anything from, you know, a million to 40 okay maybe that's a nice range yeah that's usually where like if you're if you're a studio they'll, they'll still leave you alone if it's 40 or under kind <laughs> yeah of, like, exactly it, uh you don't you don't have you don't have a boardroom kind of trying to direct your movie or produce your movie for you yeah but even with that it, it's just a different animal but it's you know it's an animal that it's not that hard to deal with if you deal with it properly you know and are you doing, I mean, you guys are based in New York, but are you doing most of your production out of New York? Or are you doing it elsewhere uh, uh, around the around the country? Primarily the East Coast, actually. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like we shot a movie in Cape Cod, New Hampshire, Connecticut, New York, of course. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, um, horror movies is all Philly, about, like you know. if you're doing a horror movie, it's, it's almost got to be like in New England or something. Right. Seems yeah, to be like, exactly. Like horror central seems right. to be. Yeah. Or like maybe you can get Old away with. Old buildings. Yeah. Very spooky. <laughs> there aren't a lot of horror films that t- take place in urban environments. I think Poltergeist tried it mm. with one of them, right? Well, I, you know, I've like never seen. Haunted Pool, I, you know, right. Skyscrapers. I, 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 uh, I'm ashamed to say I haven't seen any of the sequels. I've only seen the, the first one. You don't need to see any sequels. <laughs> That's what the most first people one's tell me. Amazing. Yeah. yeah, the first one is great. I love the first one. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of great movies that I've only seen the first mm-hmm. one. Of. The but, way to go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for the most part, it's like, uh, oh, that was great, and then it just gets worse, mm-hmm. right? You know, um, Jaws. 
Yeah. Yeah. Not sad. You don't yep. need to see. You don't need to see Jaws two. Right. Jaws. <laughs> Jaws three. The re, is it Jaws three? The Revenge. Something like that. In three D. Did a three D one. Something ridiculous. Right? Yeah. yeah. People. Uh, horrible. I just remember people on water skis stacked up like a pyramid. Yeah. Uh, totally. Coming through the screen. Yep. Uh, that alone is terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, in terms of like the people that you guys represent, you're above and below the line. Mm -hmm. Now, for somebody who doesn't know what that means, explain above the line talent versus below the line talent. Uh, Above the line would be your writers, producers, directors, actors, but we don't represent actors. Below the line is everybody else, all the key crew, cinematographer, production designers, editors. Customers and, and when when uh, I don't know how you find people to represent or but is, are there certain qualities does somebody need a certain kind of resume or reel to 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 be pipeline talent? I mean, it depends on what they're trying to do. Um, but I, I mean, you know, you can't have no resume, right? <laughs> we can't work with that. Right, you you can, ha- you've had to, had to do something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> like if if a resume comes across, are you looking for someone like if it's a director, for instance? Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think a lot of people who who listen to the show are directors, uh, or would be directors. Right? Uh, do they have to have a feature under their belt? Could they have just some really great shorts? Does it matter? Not necessarily for a feature, but we also, especially with directing clients, we like director clients who do something else mm-hmm. in terms it's, of like like a director, director who's an editor or okay. producer produces or that so, sort of thing really right mm-hmm. so it's, it's important for you guys that they be multifaceted and have a skill lab uh, yeah i mean how many directors are making five movies a year yeah mm-hmm. you know it's it's hard to be a director yeah especially uh, in the feature film space yeah so yeah. it helps us keep them working and making more connections through jobs even if it's not necessarily directing jobs right it's helping us get them in the door at various companies that might be able to help them down the road with their directing projects yeah I, I, when I was talking to Richard one of the things that we talked about is you know if you're a director chances are you're not having Steven Spielberg's career no, you know you're not going from feature <laughs> yeah. to feature to feature, mm-hmm. and lots of directors like maybe you do a feature a year, mm-hmm. uh, but you're directing commercials, you're directing television, uh, you're doing uh, maybe the odd music video here and there, right? Um, and it's really more of like, uh, how do you piece together your living out of these different directing jobs? Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I'm a I I write and direct, but I also shoot and I also mm-hmm. edit and all that kind of stuff, and I think for the most part, um, we said this on another show too, it's like you you have to be multifaceted. Like Absolutely. you have to be technical these days. Just in order to um in order to uh not just in order to work, but it's good to understand the whole process. Mm-hmm. Because if you have a director who's an editor, um, you know, when I whenever I'm directing something, I'm always thinking about the edit. Like what's this gonna look like, how are these shots gonna go together. And because I've been an editor and I've dealt with not having what I want, <laughs> right. you know, yep. you, I can, I can, you know, I can sympathize with my own pain and, and hopefully solve my own problems before they begin. Um, so that's good. It's That's good stuff to know because I don't think people really realize this stuff. Like I think most people who are directors think, well, I'm a director and that's what I do. Uh, and some people can make a living that way, but a lot can't. Uh, and features is a whole other animal. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. You know? Completely. Uh, how many features have you guys produced so far? Uh, fictional narrative features so far. Let me see. Uh, a lot. Like nine, I want to say. Let me look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think eight or nine. Cool. Yeah. And that's in the past 11 years? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if you were to talk to you, to yourself, like if, if Dan now could go back in time and uh, 11 years ago before you started the company and started to get into production and, and representing talent, uh, what kind of advice would you give yourself? What would you What would you say to uh, to to young Dan about uh, forming a production company? I don't know. I've always just done it, you know, for with everything. For, you know, like I I don't know how to sail. I bought a thirty three foot sailboat and just figured it out, <laughs> kind of thing. I always uh, jump in first and figure it out as you go. You know. Mm-hmm. I don't know what I would tell myself, really. <laughs> Keep yeah. doing it's, that. It's like worked out. You know, it's it's funny. The, one of the reoccurring themes uh, that I've talked to people on this show, especially in the film industry, 
it's like a, a mantra of mine has been figure it out mm -hmm. because you never know what kind of project's going to come across your way. Right. And, you know, uh, a lot of times, you know, if you're an editor or if you're uh, shooting or whatever you're doing, a lot of times you're on your own. Right. And somebody else is doing somebody, you know, they're doing their job. They expect you to do your job. And if you don't know how to do that thing, figure it out. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, certainly in the past 11 years, it's changed a bit in terms of how you get a movie off the ground. Right. Is it harder now or is it easier now, would you say? I mean, it's always hard. You know, movies are miracles when they go. Mm. I mean, at every level. Look at Forrest Gump. It took like 20 years to get that green lit. Mm -hmm. Right. Forrest Gump, yeah. you know? And one, really? best, one best picture did very well at the box office. Exactly. Right. And that know? was in turnaround like nine times or something ridiculous, you know? Mm -hmm. what, is that, what is that like for you guys when you, like, are you generally, because you're in New York and mm -hmm. because you're, it doesn't seem like you have to deal with sort of the Hollywood machine a lot. Like, do you... You do and you don't. I mean, we certainly put a lot of clients on Hollywood movies. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we're actually, you know, it was different with Dementia 13 because I'm very friendly with the people who greenlit us. So they hardly ever even checked in. Yeah. They were just right. like, we'll see you in nine months. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. You know, which that, is great. But also very rare. Like a super rare. rare. Yeah. Extremely. Super rare. Uh, we but like this next project that we're mm -hmm. out with now, which is a, a holiday script called Playing Santa, that's leaning towards more of a packaged Hollywood type setup. And so they're going to want certain names in the picture. They're going to want certain uh, sort of accoutrement to, for the package kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And when, I mean, because it does seem like, you know, you have a good track record, like you're able to get things through production. Uh -huh. And is it because you can kind of uh, operate under the radar a little bit? Or is it just because you, you've you been doing this for a, a decade and you've got the right connections to, to get something through to production? Well, I think it's a little bit of both, you know. And because we, we manage people, we're dealing with projects and production companies and agents and studios mm -hmm. on a daily basis yeah so you're constantly plugged in yeah and they feel secure with you right right they don't exactly. feel like oh my god i give my i gotta give this project to these strangers over here mm -hmm. on the yeah, east coast like, kind of thing we're always active it's yeah. not like we have two movies and we're trying to get them off the ground and we don't do anything else mm -hmm. right so you're constantly plugged into things that are already green lit and going mm -hmm. and you're in touch with productions that aren't yours Oh, yeah. So you're, like, you're yeah. producing your own all projects, but you know what's happening with all exactly. these other projects right. that are happening. Because right. we're plugging talent, our crew, into those other projects. And has that been uh, you know, the basis of your networking uh, and things like that? Do you guys... That's a big part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? And what's been, what's been the most successful for you guys in terms of uh, a formula or a method by which that you produce things? Is it like, uh, well, we've got the right genre, the right script, the right budget the right director, um, and like with Dementia 13, that seems that seemed to just come together, you know, because well, there was an impulse. <laughs> we made it look easy. Yeah. yeah. Was, right? <laughs> but what, what is that like? What is that like? How do you, how do you make it look easy? Because I know it's not. Like I, yeah, it's anybody who's produced not. anything knows it's, it's not easy, even if it's simple. Right. Like, because mm -hmm. I want to, my other mantra is that simple, like I love simple, but simple does not equal easy. Um, so with a project like that, I know there was sort of an impetus from Universal to mm -hmm. want to make that. Mm -hmm. um, did they contact you or were you contacting them? They contacted us. They reached out. Um, one of Dan's connections at NBC Universal reached out. Dementia 13 was on their radar, Francis Ford Coppola's original. So essentially they called over and said, if you guys can verify that this is in the public domain, then we'll give you funds to make the movie. So within, you know, a couple of days, we found someone who does copyright research, had them write a whole report about the copyright status. Bing, bang, boom, <laughs> had it done. And it was like that was your green light. right? Exactly. There. Yeah. Uh, that was a, a much faster process than obviously your typical film will have. I mean, completely. Completely. It was like a little crazy. Actually. It was pretty wild. <laughs> was, was the remake because of that? Was it sort of an easier are remakes an easier sell now than original scripts? Or are people coming to you guys because you guys get original scripts? 
Uh, it's a little bit of both. I mean, all those studios are looking f to do like the big tentpole films, obviously, but right. they're all mining their libraries for pre-existing IP. Mm -hmm. Right. And Universal a has a huge now. library. Yeah. yeah. Like, I just had a conversation about it literally like two weeks ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's, that's what they're doing. Yeah. I, yeah. I, 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 when I was, I was uh, listening to Kevin Smith's podcast and he was uh -huh. talking about, he wanted to do a uh, mall rat series. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he had produced that. That was his second movie. He had produced it through Universal. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he was going to approach them and say, hey, um, you know, I want to do this. And they were like, well, we actually own those characters. And you mm -hmm. don't own your own movie. Right. Because wow. Universal is a, we're a library as well. Right. And we never sell anything back to anybody. We just, <laughs> we keep everything. Keep it forever. And and it's like, so he he owns Jay and Silent Bob mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. out of that movie, but all the other characters because it was produced through them, you know. And they said, "Well, we don't. No, nah, we don't see it. Yeah, and, we don't and, want to do that." Yeah. And then that that killed his deal. Um, but I could see this happening more for you guys too, because you know, like with Dementia Thirteen, mm -hmm. it's, it's a nineteen was it nineteen sixty two or something like that. The three, yeah, nineteen sixty three. So nineteen sixty three, and it was a, a Roger Corman joint, mm -hmm. you know, right? Yeah, and you know, the typical like you know, here here's uh, here's twenty bucks and make it in a weekend and <laughs> exactly get a and young director. Have yep. fun. <laughs> <laughs> you get all the strawberries you can eat on this right. gig because right. uh, they grow on the grounds. <laughs> yep. But like, um, and that was sort of just rife for you know plucking, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I you know and if whatever movies in that catalog they own i could see them very well doing that with you guys again or, or you know other people um it's just hard to think like like with dementia there was a certain cachet to it because it was francis ford coppola sure. and you mm -hmm. could kind of sell that but a lot of these other like uh you know like if boxcar bertha comes around that was like one of scorsese's first pictures that he did for Rock. <laughs> i don't know if anybody's gonna be like you know what box it's a time for boxcar bertha to come again. back <laughs> to come yeah. back. we're bringing it back and now it's a horror movie. Or something. I don't know. Right. Um, or the, uh, you know what? Little Shop, little Shop of Horrors hasn't been made in a little while. So let's, right. you know, let's remake that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, anyway, I would ask um, you guys, if you're someone, like say you're uh, a director, say you're a film professional, and you're looking to get representation. You're looking to you know, take your career to the next level. What, what do I need to have? What would you recommend that I do? Should I, like, do people like, if I want to do commercials, should I make a spec commercial? Should I keep Absolutely, making short yeah. films? Yeah. Um, Just keep working, really, to yeah. build a body of work mm -hmm. and network. Yeah. yeah. Network is key. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially in New York. Yeah. Because, you know, L.A., I lived there for seven years. Mm -hmm. You walk down the street, you trip over people in the industry, obviously, right? Right. right. But it's here, it's town. different, you mm -hmm. know? The Gardener has an amazing screenplay. <laughs> exactly. That I haven't read yet. I used to have to rip the covers off of scripts because they said William Morris Agency on them, and I couldn't get through one if I was reading it at like a coffee shop or something. Really? Oh. Oh. Because people, people would be would like, stop. oh, you must be... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, I got a, out of a ticket, because the cop was an actor, and <laughs> saw one of those, you know? He's like, no, no, no go, here's my card. I'm like, thanks, <laughs> officer. <laughs> you know? uh, officer headshot. Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's crazy. It's not bad, actually. If I'm ever in L.A., I'm going to carry scripts with me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Get out of tickets that way. Um, is there any other advice that you would give somebody looking to maybe take their career to the next level or somebody who's really looking to break in? I mean, breaking in, you know, you should just work as much as possible. Like mm -hmm. Caitlin said earlier, it's paid networking. Yeah. Right. You know. Mm -hmm. and, and especially like younger people who are looking to get into the industry you know, intern, PA, mm -hmm. work wherever you can because that's how you're going to make those connections. And even if you, you know, for example, if you PA in the costume department and you decide you don't want to work in costumes, you've now met everyone who's on the crew. So you can pick and choose what are you interested in mm -hmm. and start following different paths with the people that you meet by working and developing credits in the industry. Right, and and get those credits early. Like exactly. get those get get on right. get on those shows early and start doing that stuff as soon as you can. Mm -hmm. That's been another reoccurring theme that I've heard on this show from a lot of older folks who've been in the industry industry for a while. Mm -hmm. You know, work soon, work often, get those credits as soon as you can. Yeah, uh, so that you can you can have the type of like uh, one of my one of the actors that came on the show, who's been he's been acting for twenty years, and right. he's like, you know, I wish I had the resume I have now twenty years ago. Mm -hmm. Like I wish I had 
done more and hustled more and all that kind of stuff. And just, you know, with filmmaking, like, it, it's tough because you need a resume. You need to have, you know, at least a great short or something to show people. You need a reel. Right. But, you know, it's not free. So, like, and nobody's going to hire you to to make a project <laughs> until you have a project. So, you know, lucky maybe, I don't know, maybe you can con friends and relatives or somebody into, <laughs> you know, backing your your film or whatever it is um but I, I think that's always the hard part and then if you you know if you're working on a lower budget like okay so i, I have this much money but i need it to i still need to impress people mm-hmm. and and what's the magic formula for for that for yeah, yeah. for yeah. like getting a project i can afford to make without you know uh going into uh serious credit card debt mm-hmm. uh mm-hmm. and and still be impressive enough that it's going to get me that next job Mm -hmm. so I can pay for the film that I just made. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Anyway, guys, um, in terms of upcoming projects, you were talking about uh, different stuff that you've got going on. Do you have anything coming up later on this year that we should be looking out for? The next thing that we'll have coming out is uh, the documentary I mentioned earlier called The Invaders. Uh, That one's about Martin Luther King Jr. and this black militant group called The Invaders uh, in Memphis who were the last group to meet with MLK Jr. before he was assassinated. Um, So that's definitely going to be coming out. um, Probably in the fall. Probably in the fall, yeah. Fabulous, fabulous. We're just just waiting on um, kind of a famous A-list chap to do the VO right now. Oh, fantastic, Mm -hmm. fantastic. And that, that project, that's a good example because our client, Pritchard Smith, um, is a producer, director, and editor on it, and you know we executive produced with you know Craig Brewer from Hustle and Flow. Oh, cool! Mm-hmm. And Chad Scheffler, who's based out of Memphis. Yep. Um, and then looped in a company called Mass Appeal for uh, finishing funds. And was that um, was that a project that came to you, or a project that you went? It's after? actually one of Pritchard's passion project. He's been working on it for like six years. Wow! Yeah. So. God bless those documentary filmmakers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, I mean, the the movie is just amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, it's pretty incredible and very timely with all of the stuff that's happening in the country right now in terms of race relations. It's very fitting for yeah, this kind of documentary right now. It's the 50th anniversary of the assassination. Like the, yeah. Yeah. the invaders were the reason why he was in Memphis. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And nobody knows about this. Yeah. That's you know, fantastic. It's, it's like the story that nobody knows. Yeah. It's, it's really crazy. It's a little sad how topical 50 years ago is yeah. right. uh, these days, but uh, I'm glad that people are making these movies and, mm-hmm. and I'm glad that, you know, you guys are, are shepherding important projects um, and, and also making, you know, movies like Dementia 13. That are uh, just fun. Yeah. yeah. They're just fun. <laughs> and, you know. You gotta uh, do a bit of everything. This Absolutely. holiday movie. <laughs> Will be a blast to make. Oh my god! Uh, are there any uh, are there any axe murderers? Any any axe murderers in the holiday movie? No or? axe murderers. No. No, actually, okay. Um, well, Just, you know, maybe next holiday movie. Next, you know. The sequel will have an axe the murdering. Sequ- Santa we did read Claus a script like that. Silent, we did. <laughs> Silent Night, Deadly Night, twelve right. or whatever. 12. Right. Um, anyway, guys, I'm going to wrap up. But uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, where can people find you guys on the web? We're at www.pipeline-talent.com. Well said. Well said. <laughs> that was fantastic. I, could, I couldn't have said that better myself. Uh, and I just want to thank all the people out there for listening uh, and taking this trip down the rabbit hole. For more episodes, you can find it on our website, btrp.nyc slash podcast. You can also find us on places like Anchor and iTunes and Stitcher and Google Play and all those fun places that you listen to podcasts. I'd love to thank my guests once again, Dan and Caitlin, uh, for Behind the Forever Productions. I'm Jason Godby. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time.